Ernest Lee Johnson was born on August 20th, 1960. His mother struggled with substance abuse, which caused defects and delays for Ernest that continued on with him into his adulthood. His parents were together, but his mother left the family to live her own life. Ernest had a brother and a sister, and he later recounted that his father would often leave them for long periods of time, not letting them know where he was going or when he would be back. When it came to schooling, Ernest was only ever in special ed classes, but school was not for him and he dropped out before completing his ninth grade year. He ended up suffering a head injury that went untreated and turned to drugs just like his mother. He was in and out of trouble and had even lived in a halfway house because of his criminal background and drug abuse in order to learn necessary skills to eventually live on his own and reintegrate society. Despite any learning disabilities, he was able to start a relationship with a woman who had two sons. His girlfriend's eldest son, Rodriguez Grant, was an 18-year-old drug dealer, and he became Ernest's new drug dealer. On Saturday, February 12, 1994, at around 11 o'clock in the morning, Ernest went to a local drugstore in Columbia, Missouri and purchased a bottle of beer along with a pack of cigarettes. After a short while, he returned to the store for the second time that day, but this time did not make a purchase. Instead, he decided to ask the cashier, Mabel Scruggs, who would be working the next shift. She replied without hesitation and told him that she would be leaving at 5 o'clock that evening and someone would relieve her, but the store would close at 11 o'clock that night. After getting his answer, he left but returned again for the third time. On this third visit, he didn't speak to anyone or purchase anything and was in and out within about three minutes. It was now nearing 5 o'clock p.m. Ernest walked into the store for the fourth time that day with a backpack over his shoulder and stared at Mabel while she deposited money from the cash register into the store safe. Again, without speaking or purchasing anything, he left. This time, after leaving the store, he went to his girlfriend's house in order to buy $20 worth of crack cocaine from Rodriguez. Ernest left, went to go smoke, and then went back to his girlfriend's house to buy two more rocks of crack. Along with purchasing more crack, he asked Rodriguez if he could borrow the pistol he gave him weeks prior in exchange for crack. Rodriguez agreed, and once Ernest had the gun, he went to the backyard to test the gun out. The gun worked, so Ernest left but returned to the house shortly after, saying the gun was no longer working. Ernest left without the gun, but came back to the house once again, but this time left with the gun, with more layers of clothing on, a mask, and black sneakers. Rodriguez had a feeling that Ernest was going to rob a store because he later mentioned that earlier that year, back in January, Ernest told him that he wanted to rob a store and he wanted to do it by locking the employees in a room and having one employee open the safe. Ernest returned to the house through the back door at around 11.45 that night. He was covered in blood and immediately went downstairs into Rodriguez's room. He returned the pistol and began cleaning his shoes and removing his clothes. He then put the items in a trash bag and had Antoine take the bag out of the house in order to hide it somewhere. Antoine followed instructions and Rodriguez noticed that Ernest had a large amount of money so they counted it and sorted it by denomination. They then hid the money in an air vent. Rodriguez went upstairs but smelled fire. He went downstairs to check on the smell and he discovered Ernest's burning paper. Back at the store, it was a little after 1 a.m., when a deputy sheriff arrived after receiving a call for a disturbance involving weapons. Before entering the store, he saw that the lights were on, but the money vault was in the center of the store on the floor. He also noticed blood smears on the door lock. When he and other responding officers entered the store, they discovered two dead bodies in the bathroom, along with a 25 caliber shell casing and a third body inside of the walk-in cooler. There was also a shell casing near that body as well. The victims were all employees. The first victim was 57-year-old Mabel Scruggs, who was never able to leave her shift at 5 o'clock. The other victims were 46-year-old Mary Bratcher and 58-year-old Fred Jones. Although there were shell casings, no victims died from a gunshot wound. They all died from head trauma, and the likely weapon of choice was a tool that was found inside of the store. There were actually a few tools that all had blood on them, and Ernest had his way with all of them. Upon further investigation, police spoke with Antoine, who led them to where he hid the items Ernest had him hide. Police found a bag that contained bloody gloves, jeans, and a jacket in a field next to the store. The blood was sent in for testing, and it contained blood from all three victims. On Sunday, February 13th, the morning after the murders, Ernest went to a local mall and purchased $200 worth of items. 
After a shopping spree, he returned to his girlfriend's house, but was soon met by the police who began asking him questions. He agreed to accompany them to the police station, and while being questioned, he gave an alibi that the detectives did not believe, and he was read his Miranda rights. The detectives later noted that every time they mentioned the store, he would get depressed and at one point said it took more than one man to do the job. Police obtained a search warrant for his girlfriend's house and they found a bag with over $400 in it, coin wrappers, burn checks, coupons, and receipts that had the store name on it. They also found the shoes Ernest tried to clean and the shoe prints matched bloody shoe prints that were found inside of the store. Ernest was now under arrest and when in the booking room, he saw Rodriguez in a holding cell and told police, that boy didn't have anything to do with this. None of those boys did. I know they weren't there. During the trial phase, Rodriguez Grant was offered a shorter sentence of 10 years in prison for aiding and abetting Ernest before the robbery in exchange for his testimony. As for Antoine Grant, for his testimony, the state agreed not to prosecute him for charges of tampering with evidence committed after the crimes were committed. On June 20th, 1995, Ernest was sentenced to death. While on death row, Ernest appealed his case over the years. One point he made during an appeal was that there were members of the jury who were considering giving him life in prison instead of death. Ernest was able to question the jurors and his question was, do you think that if someone is convicted of multiple murders in the first degree, life without the possibility of parole is a punishment you could still seriously consider? The first juror responded by saying, the death penalty is imposed too little or too much in this country. During the penalty phase, the prosecutors objected and the judge sustained the objections. Ernest then asked another question. Where the conviction is done, going into the penalty phase, would you be leaning in the direction of the death penalty going in? He tried to ask more questions, but the court agreed with every objection. Ernest felt that it was not fair he was not allowed to question jurors, but in the appeal response, the court responded by saying they have all rights to disallow any open-ended questions in court. Ernest also argued that jurors seemed uncomfortable during the death qualification phase. One juror by the name of Peggy Edwards said, I am having quite a bit of stress about thinking that I would be the one to say that someone else wouldn't live. After being asked if signing a death verdict would be something she could do, she replied by saying, it would be a very difficult thing to do. I am just under a lot of stress about it. I'm not real sure whether I could or not. I am one of those people that always thought I believed in the death penalty until it comes down to me actually saying yes, I should go ahead and do it. It wasn't until later she voted yes on death for the unanimous recommendation of death despite her previous responses. Another juror, Angela Leap, said that she was having mixed emotions about the death penalty and said she was having a difficult time sentencing someone to death. Philip Moore was a juror who in court said the death penalty was appropriate, but at a later date he admitted that he would be unable to sign a death warrant. Deborah Tapp was a juror who said that she would probably be able to deal with life in prison a little easier. Ernest and his representation felt that there was substantial impairment to performing the duties of a juror. There were more statements from other jurors, but in the appeal denial, the court responded by saying there was no evidence of abuse of discretion. Another point in the appeal was that he felt he was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. He was drinking and high on drugs and not in his right frame of mind. The court felt that Ernest was voluntarily intoxicated and there was no convincing argument for re-examination. They also said in regards to the emphasis on reasonable doubt, that proof beyond reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. The law does not require proof that overcomes every possible doubt. Another point Ernest made was that he had ineffective counsel. He was represented by Nancy McCarrow and Janice Sembles. For the opening statement during trial, his team said, Ernest Johnson did cause the death of Mary Bratcher, Fred Jones, and Mabel Scruggs, but he did not do so after deliberation. They also said he had a crack-filled mind when they knew voluntary intoxication was not a defense to murder. His team also failed to call Dr. Sam Parwadaker to the stand. Dr. Parwadaker was a licensed psychiatrist who examined Ernest for any signs of mental diseases, defects, or disorders. The doctor was not called to the stand because he concluded that there was nothing wrong with Ernest at all and did not diagnose him with anything. Ernest felt that the only reason he was not diagnosed was because his legal team did not provide his complete social history. 
The appeal court responded by saying that Dr. Prywaterker testified that if he did get a complete social history, it would not have changed his diagnosis or lack thereof, so this point was denied as well. Ernest claimed that his team failed to get a neurological exam and failed to call certain witnesses to the stand. Although all of his appeals were denied, many people still wanted Ernest off of death row. Many people still went with the storyline that they were going to be killing a mentally challenged man. The Pope even asked for his pardon. Archbishop Christophe Pierre wrote a letter that stated, His Holiness wishes to place before you the simple fact of Mr. Johnson's humanity and the sacredness of all human life. Two members of Congress from Missouri also requested a pardon. For his last meal, he had two double bacon cheeseburgers, onion rings, two large strawberry milkshakes, and a large pizza. On October 5, 2021, Ernest Lee Johnson, who was 61 years old, received his final denial for a stay of execution from the U.S. Supreme Court and from Governor Michael Parson. He was executed at 6.11 p.m. Central Time on a Tuesday at a state prison in Missouri. Before Ernest died, he wrote a last statement. I am sorry and have remorse for what I do. I want to say that I love my family and friends. I am thankful of all that my lawyer has done for me. They made me feel love as if I was family to them. I love them all. For all the people that has prayed for me, I thank them from the bottom of my. I love the Lord with all my heart and soul. If I am executed, I know where I am going, to heaven, because I ask him to forgive me, God, everyone. With respect, Ernest L. Johnson. Before he died, he also verbally expressed remorse for killing his victims. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. And if you haven't yet, please check out one of my last few videos.